A few years ago, I heard about a nonprofit group called Giving Grove. They're based in Kansas City, Missouri. And that group was founded in 2013 with the goal of fighting food insecurity by planting community orchards across the United States. Now, in just a decade, this group has set up 500 orchards in 14 states. The fruit trees are maintained by almost a thousand volunteers. And those fruit trees are expected to produce over 65 million servings of free, healthy food in their lifetimes. And that is a lot of fruit. Now, the Giving Grove team like to plant bare root trees that come from specialist fruit tree nurseries. And that's because bare root trees are usually better quality and more affordable than fruit trees that you get from a big box store. So bare root trees are often healthier than potted trees, for instance, because potted trees can get very root bound in their plastic pots. The problem with bare root fruit trees is that you have to plant them in the dormant season, and that's in the early spring or the late fall. And that can be a little bit limiting. So each year, Giving Grove orders almost a thousand bare root fruit trees, and most are planted in the spring in various orchards, but they keep a few hundred trees aside and they get them ready for a fall planting. So they pot up these trees, not in plastic pots, but in fabric pots, because fabric pots seem to allow trees and other plants to be healthier. Their roots are healthier because they don't get root round. So when the weather then cools in the fall, they take care of these trees in the fabric pots over the hot, hot summer. And then when the weather cools, they will plant the trees, take off the fabric pots, plant the trees, and they actually clean up the pots, the fabric pots, and use them again the following year. So this was a really long winded way of saying that fabric pots are interesting and I wanna learn more about them. So my guest on the show is Kevin Espiritu. He's the guy to talk to because he's the author of a book called Grow Bag Gardening. And it's a comprehensive guide on using fabric pots, not just for fruit trees, but for vegetables and for a lot of other plants too. So Kevin is also the founder of the information packed website, epicgardening.com. So you should check that out. And I'm gonna to talk to Kevin in just a minute, but first I wanna hear from you. Have you ever grown fruit trees or any other plants in fabric pots like smart pots? What are the pros and cons? During the live show, I'd love it if you can send in your questions, your comments, or you can also just email us to say hi. Send your email to instudio101 at gmail.com. That's instudio101 at gmail.com. And do remember to include your first name and where you are writing from. I look forward to hearing from you soon. And so, Kevin, thank you for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Susan. So I'm glad you're here. And you're obviously a person who was also interested in fabric pots um, because you wrote a book about the topic. How did that come about? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I just didn't have a lot of space when I first started gardening. So I had enough space in a small front yard for a few raised beds, but really it was a lot of concrete, side yard, backyard, all sort of paved over. Uh, and so container gardening was was the way to go for me. But these grow bags or fabric pots, as they can be called, really attracted me because when you grow in a container, as I'm sure you know, Susan, you've got the issue of potentially root binding your plant, um, especially if you're growing a fruit tree. Like sometimes maybe some trees like it. A lot of trees tend to want to spread out quite a bit more than that. Uh, and so when I started learning about the fabric pots, I was like, okay, well, it's a container, but it doesn't seem to have the problems that a lot of containers do, being that causing that root circling issue. And the reason why is because it's a porous material. It's a semi-porous material, at least. And so when the roots get to the edge of the pot, instead of kind of spinning around and, and spiraling down, they tend to actually just naturally air prune themselves off so that it'll dry out when it gets to the edge tends to sort of naturally prune itself there, air prune itself as it's called, which then stimulates more growth sort of from the core root system. So you get a much more healthy looking root system closer to how it would look if it was in the ground, obviously not the exact same. 
Well, here's what's really interesting. I got a picture and I'm going to show it in the video version of this. It's from Smart Pots and they have a picture of a root ball. I think it's a blueberry uh, shrub, bush, whatever. And man, that root ball is like intense roots, lots and lots of roots. Um, so, you know, I guess that's a good thing. I guess the more roots, the more food gets into the the, the tree and plant. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea. I think what, what I've noticed, whether it's a fruit tree or or a vegetable, like a tomato, let's say, is you're going to get a more natural sort of classic branching style root system than you would in a typical container. Now, of course, anything grown in a container is not going to have the, quote, optimal root system compared to how it might grow in the soil, but it seems to be closer to optimal. And, and given that you're growing in a container, that's that's about the best you can get to. So you you tend to have plants that are are more able to uptake nutrients, uptake uptake water than they might be if they were kind of circled out like you might get at a nursery. Gotcha. Okay, we've got an email here from Edward. Edward says, "Hello Susan. Hello to Susan and Orchard people. This is a fantastic topic today since most of us are in the dark about fabric pots. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for writing Edward. That's so wonderful." We've got another email here. Hey y'all, this is from Rory and I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee and I'm at the start of my food forest journey. My question for Kevin, a lot of episodes I've watched and listened to involving fruit trees regard, regard the pruning of fruit trees to be important. If I'm going for a more full tall forest, should I be hesitant to take to the shears or is there a happy medium? Do you know much about food forests? Do you have a food forest, uh, Kevin? I would say I have a more structured food forest than most people who would call themselves food forest owners. Like, you know, a lot of people who are in the food forest world are closer towards that more permaculture approach with the seven layers of permaculture. They have their very, very tall canopy style trees. They have their smaller trees, their shrubs, their ground covers, their annuals, et cetera. I have some of that developing. But specifically for my fruit trees, and this is part of my answer to that email, is I tend to be a bit more active than some people might be with my pruning. So with my fruit trees, you know, take one example. I have a, a hedgerow of about 15 different citrus, and they're planted about four feet apart. So I don't really have the luxury, given that I planted them four feet apart, to let them just go free. They'll get a little bit too unruly, and it would kind of have kind of defeated the purpose of the way I planted them that way. I also have a, a, a large loquat. It's it's my largest tree on the property. It's about that's about 15 feet tall. I don't want it taller than that though. And it, and it could get taller. And so th this is one I inherited when I moved in. So what I've done over the last two, three years, every single year after the fruiting season for loquat, which is roughly right now. So somewhere around summer, I'll come through and I'll do a very serious prune, you know, the classics, you're dead, diseased and damaged, of course, but then I'll prune for shape and structure because I frankly can't eat all the loquats that I get. It's a very productive tree. So if I cut down a third, a fourth of the height every year and let it regrow back, that's to me, that's totally fine. What I would say to the, the writer though is, and I'm curious your perspective too, Susan, is it's really up to you. You don't have to prune a tree if you don't want to. It's just your results are going to be a little bit different. You might have you know, very productive and then very unproductive years based on, you know, the particular tree you might might be letting grow. Um, you you might find it it quite frustrating to get to fruit. Let's say you were growing a fig. At that point, figs are fruiting on mostly new growth. You're going to be very very tall up there, and you're going to have to kind of reach for those. So to me, I I would always prune my fruit tree to some degree. I'm curious what you think. Yeah, for me, I am all about pruning because for us. Um, when you're growing a fruit tree, you want the fruit, you want the quality fruit. And when you are removing some of the wood of the tree, then that energy that would go to just have this big woody tree goes into the fruit itself. So the, the fruit tree has a limited amount of energy. It's going to either put it in the fruit or in wood or a balance between the two. Since so much of fruit tree pruning is finding that perfect balance where you're directing enough energy into the remaining fruit so it's good quality. You were even talking about loquats. You can get loads of fruit that doesn't taste good, right? or you can get less fruit that is really delicious. So while you, Kevin, 
are making your tree more compact, you're also making the fruit better tasting because you're yeah. not pushing that plant to do everything all at once. I, I um, agree. Um, I do that. So this is something I do with my peaches and my nectarines is, you know, last year I did the thinning um, probably when small peaches started to form this year, I've actually done sort of a, a bud thinning before they've even started to sprout just to test it out. Cause I, I already knew I could see on the structure of the tree, there was just going to be way too much fruit this year again. Uh, and so what I did is when I did the shaping prune to kind of control the vase style canopy and, and the vase style structure, bring the height down a little bit. I also looked at branches that I thought if I, you know, fast forward time and I see this develop in my mind's eye, there's going to be too much fruit on this branch to support. Maybe let's say uh, a main, a, a branch shooting off from the main trunk that then has a, an offshoot that then has an offshoot, right? And if there's 12, you know, buds on each of those, you know, at the very tail end of that, you're going to break that stem. Uh, and so I might as well cut it off now. Uh, and it, I have tended to notice, Susan, that the fruit is, it's like you get less fruit, but the fruit's better whether that's a sweeter fruit or a better size or something like that. Absolutely. That is so exactly how I see pruning. It's a communication between you and the tree. It's it's you guys working together for a common goal. Like, uh, you know, lots of people do plant a fruit tree and they're sitting back and they're thinking, okay, give me fruit, give me what I want, right? It's a two-way street. We put in our work pruning um, and caring for the tree, thinning the fruit if necessary that you mentioned, and some people even thin the blossoms, but I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I also use pruning as part of my thinning, as you were mentioning, right? Yeah. When you're removing a branch, you are thinning, you're taking some of the extra fruit away. So what a great question. Ooh, nothing to do with fabric pots, but a really good question. We've got another one here from lovely Greg from Urban Farm Podcast. Yay. Thank you, Greg, for writing. He says, Kevin and Susan, awesome work. Keep it up. Kevin, how do the how do the fabric pots handle the heat of the low desert, i.e. Phoenix? I've had some success, but not great success with the heat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's one of the downsides, right? So every every growing method has a reason you do it, and then it has the things to look out for. And so the reason you do it, as I mentioned, is you get that root pruning benefit. You get a better root structure you tend to get a healthier plant, but of course that's if you can keep the plant healthy via normal care. And so if you're in a very arid climate that's hot, I would say Phoenix is certainly a bit hotter, but I'm, I'm in San Diego, which is a Mediterranean style climate. So what we've done is I tend to, in, in, in Greg's case, what I would probably do is I would either use a lined grow bag. So there are grow bags you can get. These are some we actually designed and developed, but you can get them elsewhere as well that have a, an extra lining on the interior. So you it's still a bit porous on that top, let's say two thirds of the sides of the bag. The bottom is, is remained unlined, but you lose a little bit less water because if something's gonna be porous and root pruning, it's also going to lose more water than a traditional plastic pot, right? Because there's way more avenue for evaporation to take place. And so what I've noticed is in warmer climates, that is the problem you, you run into with grow bags is you tend to have to water them a lot, which also means you might have to fertilize them more because you might be washing that fertilizer a little bit out of the system. So the two ways I've solved that is to go to a lined grow bag uh, or to size your grow bags up and or to also use mulch on top of the grow bag, which I think a lot of container gardeners might forget that you can also mulch your containers. Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. Absolutely. That is so interesting. Great approaches. We've got a question here from Mike. Hello, Susan and Kevin. Can Kevin touch on raised garden beds? Any good? As in our raised beds good in general? Yeah, I guess so. But I guess I understand the grow bags also, you can get them in raised bed size. Like, you, can. you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, it's interesting because everything kind of blends into one eventually a big enough container is kind of just a raised bed right um and an even bigger container like if if one was hundreds and hundreds of gallons it's kind of just like growing in soil almost um so yeah you're right i, I believe smart pots makes i think they call it like the big bag bed or something like that where you can unfold it and you get about a i don't know two by four foot space and so to me that's a great option if if you're if you don't want to build something out of wood you don't want to buy you know, a pre-built bed, 
you can just unfold it, fill it up, and you're good to go. Um, there's no real difference uh, in that than compared to like a grow bag or a raised bed. The only thing I'd say is you will lose more water than you would in, let's say, a wooden raised bed or a metal raised bed, similar to the the issue I brought up with containers, right? If you're growing in a plastic pot, you lose less water than you would if you're growing in a grow bag. But you get the benefit of, first of all, rolling out a bed and throwing it up really easy is just handy. That's just nice. Um, and then you also get a bit of that root pruning sort of benefit too. It's interesting. Uh, talking about this reminds me of a community orchard um, here in Ontario that I visited at one point. They had a tennis court nobody used and they had, I can't remember if it was pots, either fabric or plastic pots. I think it might've been fabric bags on the tennis court. So that would be a, a reason why you might want to do it if there is no soil to build a raised bed. At the same time, how are the roots going to feel, especially tree roots might be very sensitive, being on very a very hard surface that gets hot. You know, maybe it's better for a cooler climate like mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we got a couple more questions. This one is from Seth. Hello, Susan and Kevin. Seth here, tuning in from Mohican Forest in Ohio. Ohio's only section of 5B, basically just south of you below Lake Erie. Question about growing in bags. Will the winter exposure here harm the tree as cold can be able to surround the tree to a damaging degree being above the soil line. Thanks so much. And Susan, I'm currently building a huge hogo culture thanks to a previous episode. How exciting, Seth. Oh my gosh. I'm hoping you'll send me a picture of your hogo culture because I want to see what happens. So um, that is very interesting. So just with regards to the question about how damaging cold could be, what do you think about that, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a real concern. So, you know, when you're growing, let's say our writer is growing, I don't know, a peach or something like that in 5B, typically you have no problem leaving that in the ground, right? Because it's going to need to accumulate its chill hours. But he's completely right. If you were growing in, let's say, a 25 to 50 gallon grow bag or container above ground, especially with that porosity of the side of the bag, you're going to get, um, potentially you're going to freeze the container, all the way through. I, I don't know exactly how cold it gets there, but real concern, I would say. Um, and so something you can do to prevent that is you can kind of cluster the bags together. That would give them a little bit less exposure. You can cover them. Uh, you can bring them. The beauty of a container is you can bring it in and out of doors or in and out of cover. This is something I've recommended a lot for folks who want to experiment with growing things that are, quote, out of their zone, is you can grow them in a container move them into, let's say, maximum sunlight during the growing season. And then, of course, if maybe you're trying to pull like a citrus off in a in a lower zone, it's not impossible. It's just you pretty much are forced to grow that in a container and bring it in for shelter um, during, during the winter months. And so if that's the case, it, it might also be the case you'd have to do that with other fruit tree varieties if it's really getting that cold. But it's tricky because, as I'm sure you know, Susan, it's all and it depends in the garden. And so it, it does depend on how cold it'll get. How big is the bag? The bigger the bag, the less likely it is going to be seriously impacted um, by the cold. Obviously, a small 10-gallon bag would would freeze through way quicker than a 50-gallon bag, right? Um, but I, I think it's a real concern, and, and I would personally be protecting, insulating, wrapping, et cetera, or I, I may opt for a different way of growing if I was really concerned. Absolutely. And and here in Toronto in the past, <clears throat> our winters have been getting much warmer, sadly. But um, in the past, even with regular potted trees, we would just pile up, you know, whatever mulch around the pots um, just to make sure that those roots are those precious roots do not freeze, because if the roots freeze, your your tree is toast. The yeah. upper part of the tree is designed to withstand the cold, but the roots are not. Um, and they're so, you know, when they're planted in the soil, they've, they're insulated by miles and miles of soil. So you know, it's super question. I'm, I'm so glad that question was asked. We've got another question here. This one's from Jessica. Hi, Susan and Kevin. I've tried growing vegetables in grow bags, but in sunny, dry Colorado, I have a hard time keeping the soil mo moist enough for the plants to really thrive. Any tips? I'd love to have a whole set of blueberries in containers. 
So that's just from Colorado. And just I love this idea of blueberries in fabric pots because I, I, I've heard that it can be done. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's kind of especially since blueberries need their own soil that's acidic and stuff like that. What are your thoughts, Kevin? Well, I think, first of all, the blueberries in containers, it's the only way I've found to grow them successfully because I just don't have the acidity in my native soil to get close. And so I, I haven't grown them in grow bags, mostly because I have these terracotta pots that they've been in for quite a while. But um, to answer the question, one thing I've experimented with that I didn't mention yet, at least, is, you know, for a container mix of soil, it wouldn't be replicating your exact native soil and ground. And it may not even be replicating what would be in, let's say, a four foot by eight foot uh, raised bed. Every single sort of growing situation may require its own its own mix or a bit of a shift. And so the point I'm getting at there is if you're running into a, a drying out problem, like Greg mentioned, and, and this writer also mentioned, there's nothing wrong with changing your mix a little bit. And the way to do that would be to add a bit more of a water retentive ingredient. And so what I've experimented with, I mean, typically you think when you make a soil, you think drainage, you think fertility, and you think uh, retention. So you want the water to come out, you don't want so much to come out, and you want there to be some nutrition inherent within that mix. And that's what a lot of potting mixes are kind of based on. Um, so what I might do is I might say, instead of about a third, a third, a third of each of those ingredients, I might say in this case, hey, I know it I know it dries out really fast. So I'm going to bump my coconut core, let's say, up, up to about half the mix. I might go half coconut core, a quarter compost, and a quarter of, you know, wood chips or bark or that would be more for blueberries. So I don't want to, I want to be clear, like I don't want to steal nitrogen from the soil. And that would be one way to do that. Um, or maybe a perlite or a, or a pumice or something to, to add that drainage. So long way of saying just add more moisture retentive qualities to the soil mix is one way to prevent that. That is so interesting. In your book, um, the Grow Bag Gardening book, do you talk a lot about soil and how to create just the right mix? Yeah, we have, it's been a while since I've written it. So I need to remember exactly how many mixes are in there, but there's a good handful of different mixes. I believe there's a, there's a peat free mix. If that's your thing, there's a citrus mix, there's a water retentive mix. Um, and, and there's some fertilizer recommendations as well. So there's some ways to kind of mitigate it. Fantastic. Okay, another question here, and this one is from Steve. Love your radio show today. A question, does your guest have a website? Thank you. Yeah, we do. So we were on epicgardening.com if you are a reader. And then we're also sort of everywhere else on the internet. If you have a YouTube thing or Instagram or TikTok or podcast, everything's just called Epic Gardening. The podcast is called The Beat, B-E-E-T. And um, yeah, we're, we're kind of everywhere. That's part of our mission is teach the world to grow. Excellent. Okay, we've got another email from Greg, Farmer Greg, Urban Farm Podcast. And I love this question. Well, hey there, what materials are the bags made out of? Assuming that yours are made from healthy materials. Looking at your site and there are lined and unlined, what is the difference? And I, I yeah, I want to chime in there because I think that there are a lot of like knockoff bags made in all over the world that may be made of toxic mat materials. Like, so anyways, the, what's the answer to, to Greg's question? Yeah, the bags can be made from a lot of different materials, and it kind of depends on um, your own preferences as a grower. Obviously, if someone is anti-plastic in any of its forms, then a lot of grow bag materials might not be for you because a lot of them are made with some version of either recycled or, or virgin plastic spun into fibers that are ideally designed to last quite a long time. There are some, and in the book, even I cover like a grow bag is really just a container that that a garden goes in that doesn't that happens to not be fully solid. So, you know, you could use something like a burlap sack. Uh, we, we took some reader photos um, in the book and there's someone that was doing really well, just burlap sacks. It went to the store, bought a bunch of burlap sacks. Problem, of course, is that that's a one season thing. They're going to kind of decompose within a year. Someone did coffee bags. Someone did, um, you know, grocery bags. Of course, that's plastic, right? And so it, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky situation. The ones that we make, they do contain plastic. They're BPA free, UV treated. Um, the idea is that if 
my, my sort of my philosophy is if you're going to use plastic, you should try to make it last as long as humanly possible. It's an ethos we we've brought through uh, the the few things that we offer that actually do have plastic. It would be the grow bags and our our seed trays that we sell. Um, the difference to Greg's question about lined versus unlined is an unlined grow bag is basically just whatever fabric was used to make the bag itself. That's what's on the inside as well. It's just a piece, right? Uh, the lined version has an additional sewn in sort of lining on the interior to do what I mentioned, Susan, to lose less water out the sides of the bags while still retaining the air pruning benefit of the bag itself. Because if you went like extremely lined, you basically get all the way back to a normal plastic pot. And and what's interesting here is that the thing with plastic pots, they're pretty, you know, relatively easy to sanitize and use again and again. Um, with a lined or unlined fabric pot, I know people do use them again and again, but how would you do that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way to do it is, is basically you can refresh the soil directly in and not even dump it out, which I've done many times. If you're growing in like a 25 gallon grow bag and you're, you're doing carrots or something like that, just because you harvest the carrots doesn't mean you have to somehow reset all the soil. You can just throw a little organic granular for it in there if you want to reset the soil and, and just plant right in. Um, so some people just do that. They just never, they never empty it, right? Hmm. Uh, and some folks, if they are growing on limited space or they don't have too many bags or they want to do a, a different soil mix or something, dump it out, fill it back up with something that is better for the plant you're trying to grow next and, and go for it. As far as maintenance, which I is sort of where I think you were going on that, Susan, is what you you can you can use like a baking soda and like a scrub type thing to get off any residue or debris if you want because the the thing that you'll see sometimes is you'll see like some salt buildup if you have hard water you'll see that kind of show up on the fabric right or if you've overwatered or over fertilized and overwatered which is a pretty common thing that for beginners you might see like some green algae build up right um and and that's you know it's just a thing that happens if if those situations are are met in the garden. Uh, I've, I've seen it in, in containers that aren't, aren't fabric pots as well. In my pond, you know, it's just a phenomenon of bi biology. Um, so yeah, those, those are some ways to do it. Excellent. Okay. couple more questions. We've got lots of questions coming through. Um, and this one is from Eric. Eric says, hello, is Kevin an author? And you'll, you can tell us about your books. If so, what are his publications and where can I purchase them? Thank you very much from Detroit, Michigan. So tell us about the various books you've written. Sure. Yeah. So the one we're talking about right now is called Grow Bag Gardening. That was my second book. The first book was called or is called Field Guide to Urban Gardening. And the idea behind that one was it was my first book. And the idea was, hey, let's teach someone how plants grow, not necessarily how to garden, but how to become a gardener. And so it's the education behind how do plants use light? How do you plant plants? How do you create simple DIY systems at home? And, and it was really designed for someone more in, in my shoes at that phase of life, which was urban space, suburban space. Um, I'm not having some huge homestead. I'm just kind of trying to grow a little bit of produce at home for myself. So that's the idea behind the first book. And the book that just came out, which is the third one, is called Epic Homesteading. Uh, and that is kind of the story of where I live now, which is about a third of an acre lot um, small home, but a very productive orchard, uh, an in-ground vegetable garden, a coop, you know, solar panels on the roof, raised bed garden, grow bags, kind of how to tie all these different systems together beyond the garden to create a productive um, homestead. And to answer the question of where they can be purchased, pretty much anywhere books are sold. If you're out of the USA, I would check Amazon. If you're in Australia, I'd check Booktopia. And then um, we also have our own store where you can buy copies directly from us. Great. Okay, another interesting question. Uh, this one's from Andy. Um, Andy writes, I like to hold over the summer some apple trees to sell in the fall. That sounds a little bit like the Giving Grove story we talked started off with. I do live in the Midwest uh, where my apple trees can get exposed to my Midwestern summers with temperatures hitting the 90 degree mark. My question is, would it be better to cover the apple tree bags and mulch to keep them cooler or to leave them exposed to the 90s? So that's sort of the opposite of what we were talking about before. We were talking about mulching to, to protect from the cold. Would you mulch these bags to protect them from the heat? 
You know, it's a really good question. I wish I had more experience directly with apples. There's one apple I've grown and that's in ground right now. But what my sort of gardener's intuition would say is mulch does does both things. It's a buffer, right? And so it'll help, you know, hot things stay less hot and cool things stay less cool. Um, so I, I probably would. 90 feels a bit bit high for me on apples. Uh, but Susan, I'm curious what you think. Um, I would definitely, definitely mulch around the roots. Yeah. Definitely no question. And and in terms of uh, when I was thinking of putting together this show, I can see definitely how useful these grow bags are if you are in a small space and let's say you don't have in your backyard a lot of sun, but on your uh, front driveway, you've got lots of sun. We've used some grow bags before in our property in the front because that's where the sun is. And I see the usefulness. With trees, I think citrus is different. With an apple tree, they really want to stretch out their roots. And I am very much in tune with, with um, apple trees and certain other deciduous trees. And I want to see their roots go far and wide. However, our story at the top of the show about how Giving Grove is using these pots to grow the trees for a few years until you're ready to plant them, that makes a lot of sense to me. You've got a really strong root ball. Um, you can reuse the pots. Uh, you may have to sanitize them. We may hear a little bit more about that later in the show. But um, well, I probably would not grow an apple tree in the long term inside a fabric pot. But if uh, the, the reader is doing it for the shorter term, please, yeah, do mulch around the roots for sure. And just keep those roots. They're so important for that's how the tree will get uh, all the moisture and all the nutrition. So it's really important. Um, let's do one more question and then we'll have a little commercial break. Um, this one is from Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie says, hi, Susan and Kevin, using a fabric bag, what would your mix be for blueberries? Well, the one, I can only speak to the one I've experimented with and I've had success and it is roughly, oh man, it's probably about 40%. Uh, it's 50, it's, you know, it's probably 50, 50. I use micro bark. So small bark chips. And then I use a camellia azalea acid mix. Uh, so I use those two. And then I'll also throw in, call it the extra 5% of like worm castings or some sort of organic amendment like that. You might use in a, a granular fertilizer. I like worm castings because you got some good biologicals in there, not too heavy on the NPK. Um, you can't, can't really over fertilize with that, it seems like. So that's what I've done. Uh, it's, it's worked pretty well. I'm always kind of experimenting because something I've noticed with that particular mix is uh, it depends on the life within the soil, but it, they, it can sink very quickly. Um, the micro bark can decompose extremely fast. And then all of a sudden that blueberry is sort of floating <laughs> on, on nothing as, as it sinks. So I'm still, I'm still playing around with it. I don't know if you've done it, Susan, and you have a blueberry mix you really love. No, and we haven't grown blueberries yet. I would okay, love to yeah. one day, but it's just too different from the soil that we've got. Yeah. Um, we're all about easy over here. Um, I'm going to pop in another question or two. Hello, garden people. This is from Irene. Kevin, who is Ruth Stout? So Ruth Stout is a woman, I, I don't know exactly when she lived, but it was probably about 100-ish years ago or more when she was born. Um, but she was a woman who came up with a method of gardening. It's called the no work garden method or something like that. Um, great book. You can usually find a copy online or a reprint on Amazon or something. Um, and the thing that I know her for the most is just her method of trying to be very lazy effectively in the garden. Don't do things you don't have to do. And so something she would do all the time is she would just drop potatoes on the ground, cover them with hay, not bury them, and then just walk away and, and not do anything for the rest of, of the season. And then when time came to harvest the potatoes, she would just walk out, move the straw away, take all the potatoes she wanted, and then just move on. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just sort of proof that you can go to the nth degree in your garden if you want to. And I love to do that, frankly. And I think all, all people, you and I, Susan, we love to kind of get deep into it. But um, if you're just going for food production, sometimes you don't have to get that fancy. Jacques on our team, who's a, one of our gardeners, he tried the Ruth Stout potato method this year. And it was actually fascinating because again, you you don't bury them. They're on the surface of the soil. You throw maybe six inches of straw mulch on top to of course, protect them, 
keep moisture in. And the potatoes just sort of grow in that six inch mix. So when you move the straw away, unlike normal potatoes where you have to dig them up and maybe you might spear one on accident, which I've done a million times, you can just see the whole structure of the plant right there. Uh, it's very fascinating. And he had some amazing harvests just doing that. I think it's so interesting. Hey, I have no problem with easy. I love easy. Yeah. Um, and I did a previous episode on food forests. And I love the idea of, of let's do some more perennials, like perennial vegetables. Let's do Let's let nature do the work. We give it the love, we give it the nurturing, but um, it's not as much work as annuals. I, I just love, but I love that potato idea. We've yeah. got an email from Caleb. Uh, hi, Susan and Kevin. Caleb listening live from New Zealand at 7 a.m. on Wednesday. Wow. I'm aware the old French and Italian gardens had lots of citrus in planters, some with removable sides. I believe that this was so they could replenish soil and root prune. Fascinating. I had no idea. Does Kevin know if we have developed uh, past needing to do these practices? Sorry, there's a typo. I'm not exactly sure. With air pruning and modern fertilizer, or is it still good to do this periodically? So, oh, do, oh mm -hmm. if we have developed past needing to do these practices. So do mm -hmm. we not have to have open sides anymore for our pots? Um, especially for citrus, or would that be beneficial? Would you like to design a fabric pot with a zipper that you, you could know, open? I didn't know that either. I'm going to have to research that because to me, that's fascinating that that would be the case. There is a fabric pot. It's not one that we offer, but I've seen it out there. It's called the potato pot. Uh, and so it does have a transparent side that you can zip down and like harvest the potatoes out of the bottom. So you don't have to like dump the bag out. The question is reminding me of that. I don't think that's it's not something I've tried. I don't, I kind of like personally dumping it out and seeing what I got. I don't really want to see it develop. Uh, but to answer the question, I do think that if back then there was something that could air prune the sides, they probably wouldn't have developed the removable sides. That being said, I think there's, there's some merit to the idea of root pruning no matter what container you're in, I think like on a long enough time frame for like a five, seven, 10 year citrus, which of course citrus can go much longer than that. Even in a grow bag, you're, you're going to want to probably do a root prune or a pot up or a resize. I mean, I, I'm thinking, let's say, let's say you had a 50 gallon container or something on year five to seven, you may just want to do a hard prune reset, bring it all the way back down to something more manageable and can in conjunction prune the roots. And so that would be an easier way to do it. That being said, you you also could just pop it out of the pot and and pop it back in. I don't I don't see a problem doing it that way either. But it's cool to imagine these these ancient gardens kind of doing it that way. I I would love to know where that uh, that information is from. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's have a few minutes. I'd love to listen to um, some words from our sponsors. And we're going to come back. We'll talk a little bit more. And I think we have a surprise guest on the second part of the show. So people are going to have to come back after the commercial break to find out who it is. But thank you, Kevin. So are you okay hanging on the line for a couple of minutes? Absolutely. All right. You are listening to Orchard People, radio and show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101. I'm your host, Susan Poisner, and we're going to be back right after this little break. Do you want to learn how to grow organic fruit trees quickly and successfully? I'm Susan Poisner from OrchardPeople.com, and I teach online courses. Here's some feedback from one of my happy students. My name is Jennifer Chandler and I started growing fruit trees three years ago now. I would recommend Orchard People courses primarily because it is an excellent way to get up to speed fairly quickly and to build your confidence. There seem to be so many different theories of what to do and different recipes for this and that. One isn't overwhelmed by the advice in Orchard People. I just find it so much faster to get up to speed and build confidence than trying to piece it together surfing the web or at the library. Check out my courses at learn.orchardpeople.com. If 
if you're listening to this show, you are passionate about fruit trees. But do you care how your trees are grown? Silver Creek Nursery is a family-owned business, and we grow our fruit trees sustainably using only organic inputs. We stock a huge range of cultivars, like Wolf River, an apple tree that produces fruit so large you can make an entire pie with just one apple. We also carry red-fleshed apples, like Pink Pearl, as well as heirloom and disease-resistant varieties of apples, pears, apricots, cherries, and more. We ship our trees across Canada, and we can also supply you with berry canes and edible companion plants to plant near your trees. At Silver Creek Nursery, we grow fruit trees for a sustainable food future. Learn more about us at silvercreeknursery.ca. If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes over 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog, we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Wiffle Tree Nursery. Call us today. You're listening to Orchard People, a radio show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm your host, Susan Poisner. And in the show today, we've been talking to Kevin Espiritu. He's the CEO and founder of Epic Gardening, and he's also the author of Grow, Grow Bag Gardening, right? That's your book, Kevin. That's it, yeah. So we have been going into depth about fabric pots, using fabric pots, and uh, how to you know use them in your garden. We're going to talk about that again in just a minute, but if any of you have questions or comments or want to share your experience, experiences with fabric pots, just email us right now in studio101 at gmail.com. And remember to say where you're writing from and your first name. So we know where you're coming from. So um, Kevin, we have another question here. Uh, this one. Oh, let's see. Nope, we don't have another question. That was the previous question. Um, so Kevin, at the beginning of the show, I talked a little bit about Giving Grove. And have you heard of that organization? I have not, no. Well, we have a special guest today um, because I had called Giving Grove. I know that they use smart pots, which is a type of fabric bag um, for their application. So I thought I would invite Matt Bunch from Giving Grove uh, to talk a little bit about it. Matt, are you with us on the line? Yes, yes. Hello, Susan. Hi, Matt. What's your position at Giving Grove? Yeah, so uh, I am the horticulturist for the, the Giving Grove uh, and, and we are a national organization that works with other community gardening organizations to get orchard, uh, uh, urban orchard programs established. So I am, I am talking to you in Kansas City uh, because Kansas City is where uh, the Giving Grove first got started. And so we, we work under the umbrella uh, of Kansas City Community Gardens here in Kansas City with over 250 uh, neighborhood orchards around the metropolitan area. Wow, so that's a lot of orchards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so how did, how did your involvement, like I do understand that you put the trees in the ground, you're not using the smart pots or the fabric pots for the long term, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, we we just use the uh, the the smart pots uh, in a nursery situation. So we we do order 
uh, about a thousand bare root trees in every spring, uh, expecting another, another shipment to come in in a couple of days now. And then uh, we will plant out some of those bare root trees in the spring. Uh, but what we are unable to plant out in the spring, we save for our fall planting season. And, and so we will pot them up in these fabric pots, anywhere from uh, from number fives to number twenties, and then we will uh, we will over summer them in the nursery, which which basically means we're providing water, we're putting mulch around the root bags to help keep the pots a little bit cooler, and putting mulch on top of that on top of that potting mix uh, to help retain moisture as well. Well, yeah, that's moisture interesting. retention and, and cool is, is definitely important. Because yes, in the show today, a lot of people are saying, wow, they need a lot of water. And, and Kevin, you were saying that as well, that that's one of the, the main considerations is if you're going to do fabric pots, you need to water them. Am I right, Kevin? That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the trade-off I've found is you, you tend to lose more water, but you get that root pruning benefit. So Matt, are you seeing that uh, when you do take the trees out of the fabric pots, what do you see in terms of root balls? Yeah, so uh, what is nice because I've, I've planted plenty of trees and planted plenty of container trees. And with, with those sort of plastic container trees, you get that classic spiraled root system, very root bound. Uh, and it, it's very troublesome once you take that plastic pot off, then you're, you're forced to either pull those roots out, tease them out, or sometimes butterfly the whole root system. Whereas you uh, pull the bags off of these, off of these uh, uh, smart pot root systems, and you see this nice fibrous root network that is going all throughout that that fiber pot it's 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 a really neat thing it's interesting because when i was researching this episode i looked on youtube and there's somebody who shared a video saying do not never never plant a tree in a fabric pot because when you rip the pot off you're ripping the roots as well do we what do you think matt yeah so so these pots do prune roots and and so that is that is one of the things that they do. Uh, now, when we take these pots off, so we, we've had to figure this out, you know, 10 some odd years ago, how do we get these pots off effectively without destroying the root system? We, uh, we turn a five gallon bucket, uh, we turn it upside down and stand the tree and the pot on top of that five gallon bucket and then just peel that, that root bag that smart pot right off. Yes, you hear the ripping of fine roots, um, but these are very fine roots. These, this is this is root pruning. Uh, the the benefit is you end up with a a much larger network of roots. You have you have we'll say a thousand miles of roots versus a hundred miles of roots. Uh, I know I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but uh, you do have a lot more root mass. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. And the, the last thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, Matt, when you and I had talked offline, you were mentioning what you guys do because financially you need to reuse those bags and also for the environment, you want to reuse the bags. Yeah. So how do you ensure that fruit tree diseases won't go like if you've got apple trees in those bags and one apple tree happens to have canker or God forbid fire blight or something, and then you put another apple tree in there, you're in big trouble. How do you pretend, prevent that from happening? Yeah, certainly, and and yeah, fruit trees have have their dirty little secrets. Uh, yeah, things like fire blight for sure, um, and and some of these pots we have been reusing for ten years now, so so they have longevity. Uh, so we will we will uh, get these pots off. We will take them back to our shop, and then uh, we will just set aside a day oftentimes with volunteers, thank you very much volunteers, uh, to one, brush all of the roots, cut all of the roots out. And then we will, uh, once we have this relatively clean, we will use a, a uh, certified organic copper fungicide on the pots. And so after we have done that, 
the the system uh, the the pots should theoretically be free of disease. Excellent. Very interesting. Okay, a couple more emails have come in. One is from Grace. Hi, Orchard P. I guess that's Orchard People. I live in an apartment and want to start start growing. Any tips or tricks? I live in NYC. Kevin, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly, this is how I started gardening myself. So I was in a small townhouse in San Diego, California with no no like outdoor space at all. I had an outdoor sort of entrance to the house, obviously, but that was on a north facing covered awning. So it was like, good luck, you know, full shade. Um, so what I did is I used a windowsill that was south facing and I just had one of those very slim sort of sit on sill planter type things on the inside of my window and got some, got some soil, any basic potting mix would have done just fine and threw herbs in. I think actually I, I did herbs because I don't know, it felt, felt easy. I didn't know much about gardening at the time, but lo and behold, actually one of the higher value things you can grow in, in the home garden. If you think about going to the store and buying herbs, like it's, it's weird to see a couple of sprigs of rosemary for like four ninety nine, three ninety nine, when you could just have a, a bush effectively at, at your own house forever. Um, and so to me, that's an amazing way to start. If, if you don't want to do that and something else is more interesting, I might suggest microgreens. It's another way that, that I started out is any, anything that contains soil will work here. You could use something recycled, an old milk carton. You could use a tray, put some soil down. You'll grab a bulk pack of seeds. So like a big lettuce mix pack or something like that. And you sprinkle it much heavier than you would normally if you were growing in a normal vegetable garden. And they'll grow in a mat and you can kind of harvest them after about 10, 12 days. You get a nice little little bit of greens. And it's a very easy approachable way to start gardening in in literally any space. I love that. Now, Grace doesn't mention if she's got windows or like everybody's got windows, but if she's got a sunny window, are there options if it's a sort of darker apartment? Would you get her to invest in lights? Or I've always wondered, do normal house lights support plants if you yeah. leave a light on it, a regular light? Not really. And, and the reason why is because what we think is enough light for us to see, of course, the plant's not using it to see, right? It's using it to photosynthesize and generate energy. And so when you think about an indoor like overhead light, like the one on any of our faces right now, it's just nowhere near enough actual photons <laughs> to, to develop uh, enough energy for the plant. And so what I've recommended to folks starting is you can go to any big box store, buy what's called a T5 fluorescent shop light. It'll just be a shop light, uh, like a, you know one of those long sort of rectangular style lights you would hang over like a workbench or something. Um, and then as a rule of thumb to not get it, get into all the like nerdiness about light and how plants interact with it, just put it as close as possible to your surface of your plant without burning it, like literally without getting so hot that it burns it. Um, you know, you can try being very close. And if you see a little wilting, just bring it up until you don't see that that's going to be the best option for you. Cause even that is actually still worse than sunlight. Uh, and the sun's 93 million miles away. That's how powerful the sun is. So yeah, I would recommend if, if you don't have a good access to like sunlight streaming through a window, then I would recommend get, getting some sort of light and doesn't have to be a fancy grow light. And, and yeah, they don't have to be too expensive. One more question here. This one is from Pam. Pam says, hi, Susan, no contest today from Quebec. And um, so Pam knows that for this, this show has been on air for, I don't know, many years now. And I've always run a contest. And in the past few months, I'm trying to simplify my life a little bit because I was always juggling so many balls. And I'm afraid the contest got axed. Sorry, guys. Oh my gosh, no contest. <laughs> Too much work to find somebody to donate the prize, even though I've got wonderful authors often on the show to get things uh, shipped up, to follow. Anyways, I'm sorry, Pam. I hope you still love the show, uh, but no contests for now, for the time being. So we're, we've just got a couple more minutes. I would love to hear, uh, because we had that question about indoor growing, I'd love to get an answer from both of you guys about what for you is an ideal application for grow bags and can they actually be uh, grown indoors? Let's start with you, Matt. Would you ever use a grow bag inside? I personally would probably not, just, just given uh, how I know uh, they do how they drain 
and and most of the time these grow bags now granted you can find some rather small grow bags um uh, now if let's say you had a sunroom perhaps uh let's say you did have uh some sort of greenhouse off of of your kitchen uh something like that uh certainly but no, I think the, the the application for these and and Kevin, I I love how how you got started out with this because I've I've been using grow bags in my driveway for years for mm. a lot of the annual vegetables and you know that's that's just that's where I have the sunlight you know it's it's on the asphalt it's not in the yard itself so um, I think they are definitely a, a an, an outdoor application and uh, vegetables for sure but small fruits definitely too fruit trees just housing them in the nursery but small fruits and vegetables for sure. Oh, fabulous. And what about you, Kevin? What are your favorite applications, especially in terms of fruit, like, I don't know, strawberries or whatever? I think strawberries are actually a really good application. Um, if you don't want your strawberries kind of running all over the garden, because of course they put out those runners that'll, you know, they'll, they'll do some damage if you let them really run. You might want that damage and you might want more strawberries. I agree with Matt. I really probably would not use a grow bag indoors. I'd use uh, containers with effectively no drainage holes, or I'd use a pot and pot style method where, you know, kind of like houseplant owners will do where they'll have like their plastic pot with drainage into an aesthetic pot without drainage. Um, but interesting things that I haven't mentioned yet is one way to use a grow bag I thought was kind of cool is you could use it as like a portable pollinator patch. So you could have your, your like a little wildflower mix and you can bring it to the garden, um, when, when it's time. Right. And, and like, like I say, you're growing cucumbers or something like that, your squash, you could bring it over in that area and you're sort of attracting a little bit more pollinators than you might be otherwise. Uh, that's something that, that I tossed in the book that I thought was kind of a cool application. Um, you can use them as like almost storage. So let's say you're growing potatoes in a grow bag, right? Well, when potatoes are underground, starting to chit and starting to throw out that growth, they don't really need light. Um, effectively they're sort of in seed format, right? And it takes about a couple of weeks for potatoes to come up. So back when I had a lot less space than I did now, or I do now, is I would keep all my potatoes in grow bags in the dark in, in the garage until I started to see the sprouts. And then I'd bring them out and, and sort of put them in the light. Another thing I'll do in, in that situation is I'd roll the edge of the bag down so that it hits the light faster. Because if you think about it, you know, your potatoes, you want to keep like sort of burying as you grow them, or that's one way to do it. If it's that far down in the bag, so the sun actually won't hit it just because the way the angle of the sun works. And so I'd roll the, the bag down and let let it access um, the light. Other things you could do, I mean, you could you, you could just do themed bags. I thought that's really interesting. So the salsa bag or the citrus, you know, the citrus bag, um, the berry bag. There's a lot of different sort of themed ideas like that. Oh, awesome. Well, people should get your book. So, okay. Remind us again, how they can find out more about you, more about grow bags. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're at Epic Gardening anywhere on the internet that you like to consume gardening content podcast is called the beat B E E T. And then for books, anywhere books are sold. If a lot of our listeners here sounds like are in Canada. So Amazon Canada is probably the best source. We, we currently on our store do not ship to Canada. Hopefully we change that soon, but you can buy the books on our store as well in the States. And Matt, what about you? If people want to learn more about Giving Grove, maybe they want to start a uh, community orchard near them and get some advice from you guys. How can yeah, they find yeah. out more? Yeah, so uh, uh, go to Giving Grove, uh, G-I-V-I-N-G-G-R-O-V-E dot O-R-G. And so you can find out a little bit more, find about find out about our impact. Uh, and if you are interested in bringing an orchard program uh, to your city. Now we are currently not in Canada. We, we are in 14 cities throughout the US, but um, yeah, don't see why, why we probably couldn't be. We would welcome you here, but also lots of our listeners, but 60% are in the United States. So you may get some calls. That would be great. <laughs> well, thank you for both to both of you guys for coming on the show today. Uh, we'll wrap it up for now. But if the listeners want to see what we've talked about, I'm going to be putting up in the next day or so a video version of this podcast with lots of images. I've got fantastic images from Giving Grove of their applications. 
I've got some images from Smart Pots. I've got lots of great images. So you you can find that on the Orchard People YouTube channel. Or if you need to listen again or want to listen to other episodes, that's at podcast.orchardpeople.com. So that's it for today. Oh my goodness, it's it's already time to end the show. Again, thank you to Matt. Thank you to Kevin for coming on the show. It's been such a delight to interview you. I hope you guys will come back again someday. Hey, thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Susan. So that's all for now. I hope you, the listeners, will join me again next month when we're going to dig into another great topic. I'll see you then.